Good morning. For those tuning in who don't know me, my name is Robert Norris, and as well as a businessman, I'm part of the leadership team at St Albans Baptist. I want to thank you for tuning in as I share from the Word this morning. Let me start by asking you, what are your expectations post-lockdown? Level 3 for many of us won't be much different, but we will get to Level 2 and then Level 1. Let me ask you, are you worried? Do you have concerns? What will living in a recession that they're forecasting be like? What will happen if COVID-19 re-establishes itself in this country? You know, if you have concerns, I understand. You see, the world has changed. COVID-19, more than any other recent event, has meant our old normal has gone and may never return. So we have to ready ourselves for a new normal. Let's consider what people are saying about some of the potential immediate effects for us in New Zealand today. So the government is predicting 200,000 plus unemployed. Social distancing has become a new normal. We have new vocabulary like bubble and social distancing and be kind. International travel has gone for the immediate future. There is an increased fear of disease. International tourism is also gone for the foreseeable future. And there have been billions wiped off our economy. The government had a surplus and now with the amount of money that they're trying to pump in to keep the economy going, they're going into a significant debt situation. They're going to bring forward major capital projects, which will be fast-tracked and help to stimulate the economy. And we have experienced levels of government intrusion and control over our lives never before seen in this country. And I've come across some predictions about what's going to, what life is going to be like after we get out of alert levels. And this is just some of the ones that I've seen. People have liked spending time together as families, and there'll be an increase of doing that in the future. Purchasing online and con continues to increase, and bricks and mortar selling, well, that continues to reduce. Online streaming continues to significantly increase and video conferencing between friends and people and in business becomes normal. There is a, a bit of a boom in local tourism's, uh, tourism while Kiwis can't travel overseas. And there will be many businesses that close during this time. But there will also be many new initiatives that start. House prices and commercial property prices will fall. Increase, there will be increased flexibility in how people carry out work in the future. And low interest rates are likely to remain for some time. People will try to work to an older age because reti their retirement nest egg in KiwiSaver has largely been reduced. And work traditionally carried out by migrant workers will now be done by Kiwis. And some people are even saying there will be an increase in growing your own vegetables at home. And this is just some of the predictions that I've heard. You've probably heard others. But what will life be like post-lockdown? One thing that I have learned about trying to predict the future, the future has a habit of surprising everyone. Doing the unexpected, the only thing that we can really be certain of is that in the weeks, months, and even years ahead, things will be different. And we need to be prepared for change. In fact, we actually need to embrace change and learn to be agile and adaptable through change. Change, though, can easily increase stress and worry for people. And these changes may also have a serious impact on some of us. For me, for instance, as a business owner, what effect will these future changes have on my business? And as a church elder and in charge of the church finance team, what effect 
is our future going to have on the church finances? And what limitations will there be in us meeting together? What things are we able to do and not able to do? And as a husband and father, what impact will this, this future have on my family? You know, like you, there is plenty that I could worry about. But didn't Kelly share an encouraging message last week about growing in joy as we go through trials and how we need to shift our thinking to get to this point of joy? And as we prepare for our future with very real possibilities of recession and restriction on our lives, it is understandable if we feel we are either in a desert or at least going into a desert time. And let me ask you, how would you like to come out of your desert? Some people may feel like they can only crawl out of the desert, barely surviving. Others, however, may feel they're coming out in a high-performance desert racer. I know which I would prefer. The key for coming out of this time well is to understand, friends, where we are positioned. So the question, or the real question, I want, uh, want us to consider this morning is this. In this climate of change, where will you and where will I position ourselves? Will you position yourself so you'll feel like you're only crawling? Or will you position yourself so you feel like you have energy to burn? As we consider this question, I think there are two general camps we can position ourselves in. The first is the camp of trust in God. And the second is the camp of our own natural re solutions, relying on ourselves. You know, there's a story in Genesis 32 I'd like us to look at this morning about two camps. The let me give you a bit of background. The patriarchs of the nation Israel are Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob. And this story concerns Jacob, the second son of Isaac. Now, Jacob's name means schemer. And Jacob spent his whole life scheming. He schemed his older brother Esau out of his birthright and also out of his father's blessing. He spent 20 years working for his uncle Laban, scheming to gain wives and wealth. And I think some of us can relate to Jacob. We try to scheme up solutions to our problems, try to work things out in our own ability, trusting in our own strength. However, an interesting thing, despite Jacob's scheming, God still blessed him. And that was because of the promise and the purpose over his life. Isn't that encouraging? Despite Jacob's behavior, and bec but because he was under the promise, he was still subject to blessing. Jacob just tended to choose the hard way of receiving it. Interestingly, even though Jacob received blessing after blessing, he was still full of fear and worry. He was genuinely afraid of meeting his brother Esau again. You see, Jacob's past of trying to scheme his way to a better future instead of relying on God was catching up with him. 20 years ago, he had fled from Esau to Laban because of his scheming and deceit. Now, he was fleeing Laban right back to Esau. And we can be guilty of this as well. Even when we have experienced provision, protection and blessing from God, as soon as difficult times come or become evident, we can fall back to a default of fear. You know, Jacob was the man of promise, but up to now he hadn't been living out of promise. He had been living out of fear and he was continuing to do so. At the start of Genesis 32, God is once again trying to show Jacob he doesn't have to fear. That people of purpose and promise have God with them, guiding, providing and protecting them, strengthening and supporting during difficult times. But we read in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 32 in Genesis. Jacob also went on his way 
and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Now the word Mahanaim means two camps. One camp was the camp of God's, and the other was Jacob's camp. Interestingly, when Jacob left his homeland 20 years earlier, he encountered the house of God and received God's promise for him. Jacob was invited to be part of God's house, invited to be blessed and be a blessing to others. And we can find that in chapter 28, verses 12 to 15. And we can read there. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth and its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So now Jacob was on his way back as part of promise fulfillment. On the journey, Jacob encounters the angels of God camped and ready to protect him. Designed to help Jacob see that he could trust God and live under the promise instead of living by his own strength and scheming. God was encouraging Jacob to stop living with fear and doubt. And friends, we have the same invitation. We don't have to be controlled by fear. We can have hope in any and every circumstance. We also are people of purpose and promise. We don't have to fear. Consider what Romans 8.31 says. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And we can encourage ourselves with verses like this. Unfortunately, even with the evidence of God's protection, Jacob still relies on his own resource. Fear still rules his mind. And when faith is crowded out by fear, we are prone to start scheming and relying on our own resources. But during times of change, we need to and can have a higher perspective. We can position ourselves in a different camp. And this is what Isaiah says in 12 verse 2. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Fear will sap us, leaving us feeling like we are crawling out of this desert. Faith and trust in God will energize us. So Jacob camps beside God's camp, and then he sends messages to Esau and lets him know he's coming home. The messages return saying that Esau is on his way with 400 men. Wow! When Jacob receives this report, all he sees is the negative possibilities of the circumstance, and he interprets it wrongly. He forgets that he has the army of God camped beside him. Instead of relying on God, he forgets that camp and he makes his own two camps, dividing his family, thinking that this effort might provide him with some protection. You're right. We read this in 7 and 8 of chapter 32. In great fear, in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. You know, it is so easy to succumb to all the negative news. It is so easy to succumb to all the negative news we see during these times. But friends, believers who are walking by faith don't need to fear the enemy or whatever bad news they may get. We don't need to be afraid of change. We can trust God. In fact, this is what David said about someone submitted and committed to God. He said in Psalm 112 verse 7, 
He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. And our God can be trusted. Jesus can be trusted. To his credit, Jacob does pray one of the great prayers in the Bible, a tremendous model of, for praying when we're in trouble or when we're facing difficulty. And this is in verses 9 to 12. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups or two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers and their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper, and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. You know, Jacob showed humility and honesty in his prayer. Even though Jacob's actions demonstrated a faith that was weak. He prayed a prayer of faith. It was a prayer that demonstrated Jacob understood God's character. He understood that God is good and faithful. So Jacob also reminded God of his covenant. He said, God of my fathers. And he reminded of God's command. It was God who told him to go back to his homeland. Jacob reminded God of his care during his time away. And he reminded God of the purposes and his promises over his life. And of course, he asked God for help. And although in times of uncertainty, we don't want to imitate Jacob's fear and unbelief or Jacob's scheming and proneness to jump to conclusions, we would do well to pray the way he prayed. Jacob claimed God's promises, remembered God's goodness and rested completely on God's character and covenant in his prayer. And friends, no matter what happens, no matter what we're afraid of, we can trust God to be faithful to his character and to his word. What promises do you need to declare and claim? What aspects of God's character do you need to remind yourself of today? What purposes for your life do you need to trust God for now? What do you need to ask God for today? Then finally, at the end of chapter 32, Jacob finds himself face to face with God. Again, Jacob had made two camps. He's sending his family across the river for protection, this being one camp. Jacob on his own on this side of the river as the other, other camp. It appears Jacob still hadn't learned to trust God with his future. At least, however, he put himself in a position to meet God. When we're alone and when the radio and TV are turned off, you know, we can't escape into other people's hearts and minds or be distracted by noise. We're left to face ourselves and make ourselves available for God to meet us. Friends, time by ourselves in quiet, open to God, is a powerful place to be. We read in, in verse 24, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Scholars believe this man was a pre-incarnate form of God. And we are reminded that God meets each of us in ways that we understand. To Abraham the pilgrim, he became as a traveller. To Peter the fisherman, Jesus came with fish. Jacob had spent most of his life wrestling with people, and so meets God as a wrestler. The Psalms also remind us of this in, in Psalm 18, where it says, To the pure you show yourself pure, but to the crooked you show yourself shrewd. You know, Jesus meets us at our level in a way that we understand. And this is so good, friends. How does God meet you? Jacob needed to learn to surrender to God and to confront who he was and the deficiencies he had. Difficult times are one of the prime places God uses for doing this. It is so important to know who we are and whose we are, 
especially during times of change. Character is so much more important than circumstance. And God uses this time with Jacob to deal with the basic character issues that he had. Verses 27 and 28 say, The man asked him, What is your name, Jacob? He answered, Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Now, God didn't ask Jacob's name to get information. God already knew his name. God asked the question so that Jacob would gain understanding. Interestingly, the last time Jacob had been asked that very same question by his father before he left to go to Laban's, and on that occasion, he lied. Then an amazing thing happens. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, from a name that means schemer to a name which means one who wrestles with God and prevails. Jacob had lost the battle, but he won a tremendous victory. Just like the Apostle Paul said, when he became weak, he became strong. And from now on, every time Jacob spoke his new name, the name of Israel, he was reminding himself of his new identity, of who he was in God. And during times of uncertainty and difficulty, God will cause us to confront things that limit his ability to work through us. You know, we may have relied on our employment, our family, our financial position, our sense of continuity and normality for our security. And none of these may be permanent and don't provide ultimate security. Our security can only truly be found in Jesus. Regularly declaring who we are and whose we are will shift our thinking, renew our mind, and help us overcome fear and doubt. Difficult circumstances aren't just to be endured. They are opportunities for victories to take place. As we have seen, Jacob kept forgetting who he was and whose he was under the promise. He didn't realize the authority he had in God. So often we choose to live in the camp of fear and doubt because we forget who we are and whose we are. We forget the authority that we carry in Christ. Being in God's camp provides us with immense authority. Remember the centurion? We read about him and his sixth servant in Matthew chapter 8. And this is what the centurion said, and listen to Jesus' response. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. The centurion understood the principle of authority. To have authority, you need to be under authority. Because we are under authority in Jesus, we can speak with authority to circumstances, to sickness and to situations and bring victory. Jesus commended the centurion for having tremendous faith because the centurion understood this principle. The centurion hadn't succumbed to fear and doubt because of how the circumstances looked. He had faith of a better outcome because he, understood, because he understood how authority works. And we can be like Jacob and choose to live in the camp of our own strength and scheming, the camp that leads to fear and doubt. Or we can choose to live in the camp of God's armies and live empowered by his authority, acting with authority. And friends, whatever tomorrow brings in Jesus, we have hope of a better future. No matter what we suffer and persevere through, we have hope of a better outcome. And this type of hope doesn't disappoint. 
when we choose to live in God's camp, we will always have hope. We will live under the promises of God. We get to live out of our new identity. We get to declare God's purposes and promises over our lives while coming to God with humility and honesty. We get to take authority because we are under authority. We can remember who we are and whose we are. And here are some things that we can start doing today. We can speak life into our circumstances. We can declare our future based on God's promises. Our words can propel us to experience everything that Jesus has already won for us. We can receive a fresh impartation of grace. We can live according to our new name. We can overcome our doubt and fears. We can renew our mind. We can be filled with hope, peace and joy by the Holy Spirit. You know, God is faithful. No matter how our circumstances look, let us choose to trust him and live in his camp today. Let us navigate the change ahead with our confidence in Christ. Let us choose the camp that will energize us so that we come out of the desert in an awesome off-road racer. May God bless you and yours today. Thank you for listening. Good morning, St Albans. It is so good to be with you today. For anyone that I haven't met before, I'm Trudy. I am missing my church whānau so much and I can't wait until we are all together again. Just following on from Robert's talk this morning, I'd love to share with you about how I came to be in God's camp and to have a hope that comes really only from him. It was in 2013 and I was um, in a really bad space. I'd had what I call my Memphis meltdown. And I was feeling extremely vulnerable, extremely lost, really concerned about the future, really fearful. And I just had this really overwhelming sense of losing control. It was an awful space to be in. And I think it's a space emotionally that a lot of people could relate to at the moment with the COVID-19. That sort of unknown future and really not feeling like you have any control over anything that's happening to you. Prior to entering into my Memphis meltdown stage, I would have described myself as sort of having a superwoman mentality where I really honestly believe that anything I encountered in my life, I could solve the problem through hard work, finance, other people in my world. So it was a bit of a rude awakening to find myself in a bit of a mess. I would have almost felt like do you know when you have a pile of Jenga blocks and you're playing Jenga, all the wooden blocks are stacked up and someone pulls out that block and the whole thing collapses it, and it's a bit of a mess. That's how I was. So I got some help, I had some counselling and I had really good support from my family and friends and I reorganised my priorities in my life and I was clawing my way back up to normal. The funny thing was though, even though my life started to look like normal again and on the outside everything was fine, on the inside I had a gaping hole and I had these questions going around and around in my head that I could not make go away and they were to do with my place in the world, they were to do with my purpose and they were to do with the meaning of life and not just my life but all of us collectively, what's our point, why are we here? And I know now that King Solomon in the Old Testament in the Bible talks about this, the futility of life. Sun comes up, sun goes down, starts again the next day. So these are not new questions that people have asked over the many generations, but I was asking these questions. And I had this sensation in my gut, in, deep inside me, like a emptiness. Yeah, and it wouldn't go away. So... I had had a relationship with my creator, with God, as a young person, and I had walked away. So I had some experience of that. And I started to question, you know, is there a God? What's the point? And so I made a deal with God. I didn't know him. I didn't have a relationship with him, but he is a good God. And I made a deal with him, and he, he was kind enough to help me out. And I said to him cheekily, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a church. I'll give it a go. Uh but I'll only go to a church where they do really good work in their community. And here's part two of the deal, God. If I do go to the church, I'll only go to a church four times. And if you don't show up, I'm out of there and there is no God. So the next thing you know, I get a newsletter in our mailbox that was 
from St Albans Baptist Church, the Neighbourhood Trust, and it was talking about social worker Kim Button, an article on her and all the work that she was doing in the community. So off I went to St Albans Baptist Church and God showed up big time. And how do I know that? How do I know? Well, everyone was so kind to me, really welcoming, really warm and really went out of their way to look out for me. And it was at a time where I felt extremely lonely and alone and vulnerable. And that feeling I had inside of me started to be filled up. That emptiness started to be filled. And those questions I had running around and around my head started to recede. And that was God. He was meeting me where I had uh, looked for him. And there is a Bible verse about that in James, which talks about if you come close to God, he will come close to you. If you seek God, he will turn up for you. And it's true. If you lean into God, he will lead them to you. So that was one of my first lessons. Uh, because but prior to this, I'd sort of reached a fork in the road. I'd thought, well, I can go right. I have all these questions and I have this emptiness. And I can go right. And right is more work, more hobbies, more family, more friends, more achievements, more things. But I'd done right before. And I'd ended right back where I was, kind of lost. Yeah, and hope, not hope filled. Or I could go left and I could see God and he showed up for me. So after I started on this journey with God, after seeking him and him showing up for me, I still felt a bit lost and unanchored and untethered. And I can describe it as feeling like seeing one of those big timber logs that on land looks huge. But when you see them on the ocean, on the west coast, in the waves, getting washed about, subject to tides and storms and the weather, they look tiny and inconsequential and they have no control over what's happening to them. And that's kind of how I felt, very washed by the storms of life. So around this time, there was another verse in the Bible that God highlighted to me. And this is how he sort of speaks to us. We hear something or we read something or we hear someone talking and God basically leans over and gets a highlighter and that little bit jumps out to us and it might sort of hit us in the face or hit us in the gut. And God did this to me and it was from Hebrews. And it talks about hope, God being hope and hope being the anchor for our soul. And this is a verse that I have really taken inside of me and used ever since then in my life. Because at times when I feel untethered or washed away by the storms of life or a bit beaten up I come back to the fact that God says that he is my hope and that I can I can tie myself to him I can secure myself to him and I can trust in him I can lean in towards him and he'll lean in towards me so I chose to go left and I sought God and he showed up for me and then once I sought him I chose then to anchor myself to him and to have him as my hope and to learn to trust him and he continually shows me his goodness in lots and lots of ways in my life one of the ways this week is that i've been working on a food bank at work for the christchurch city mission and we've had been inundated with requests for food parcels at this at this time and it's a real privilege to be able to help people out in this way but over the last couple of weeks We've been struggling to get enough fresh fruit and veg through, fresh or frozen fruit and veg through. So I've really been taking that to God in my quiet times in the mornings and asking him to provide for us. And by the end of the day yesterday, we had three big suppliers come back to us, inundating us with fresh and frozen fruit and veg. And this morning as I was reflecting, I thought, well, God answered my prayer. I called out to him and he answered it. And so we can trust him in those things, those little things, and in the big things as well. So I just want to say this to you as I, as I finalise my talk to you. If you are feeling that empty, lost feeling, and you don't know your creator, and you don't know God, and you don't know Jesus who died on the cross for you, just take a turn in that direction of seeking God and ask him to show up for you, and he will. And he'll do it in a way that speaks to you and where you're at. If you do know God and at the moment you feel sort of distant and not hope-filled, 
just lean into him, lean into him, lean towards him, seek him, ask him, and he'll show up for you. And if you do know him and you have a relationship with him as your, as your father, as our creator, as the father of Jesus, just cling to that hope because he won't let us down. He is a good God and he is going to get us through this time. So this week, church, I really pray that as we move into level three, that you maintain a hope-filled perspective during this COVID-19 time and that you lean towards God and he will lean towards you. God bless you this week. Thanks so much for joining us today. And our prayer is that you have sensed God's presence with you, whether that be through the worship time, whether that be through the message or the personal story that got shared at the end, but that somehow your heart has resonated with it. And if you would like to let us know how you have been impacted, or you would just simply like to get to know us better, you can email us on office at sabc.org.nz or you could go to our website www.sabc.org.nz or find us on Instagram or Facebook and like, like our page or follow us just to kind of keep in the loop of what we're up to here at SABC. Now, if you would like to find and join in, in a deeper way with us and would like to give to the ministry here at SABC, all the details of how you can follow through with that are going to be on the following slide. Once again, we've loved having you join with us. Harai rā